the spark in, um, in a number of European cities and countries, uh, it had special importance for the Jews uh, because um, the Jews didn't have equal rights and these revolutions gave an opportunity for the Jews to achieve emancipation. And um, in every revolutionary movement, whether it was um, German speaking territories, as we know, there was no unified Germany at that time, or whether it was the Habsburg Empire, um, there were a high, uh, there were significant number of Jews who took part um, in these revolutions to, to achieve emancipation and to fight for a free world, for a better world. And I will detail a little bit this. Um, so in Hungary, it had um, two major um, importances why uh, the Jews took up the arms. Uh, for some reasons, the Jews identified as Hungarians um, first and, and secondary Jewish. So they wanted to fight for Hungary's independence. They believed that the oppressed Hungarian nation will give them equal rights and they will live in harmony. The second, that Hungary was a very agricultural country and uh, there was the institution of the serfdom. And before 1848, uh, the usual life of a serf was not much better than a slave's li uh, life in the United States. And this is important because one of the main demands of the revolutions of 1848 in Hungary was the abolishment of the serfdom. And this was one of the reasons why later uh, the Jewish 48ers picked up arms on the Union side. But let's see how they got into America. So when um, these revolutions erupted, a revolutionary army was created in Hungary. The Hungarian Revolution of 1848 was the most significant uh, across all of them in Europe. They were able to raise an army of almost 200,000 men. They defeated the Austrian army on multiple occasions and only in the end with Russia's intervention on Austrian request, they were uh, suppressed. Uh, records state that uh, from 20 to 35,000 Jews fought in the Revolutionary Army, um, and that exceeded the proportionate number of the Jews. There were only 300,000 Jews living in uh, the Hungarian part of the uh, Habsburg Empire. And 35,000 certainly means like a full mobilization. So both religious and both secular Jews were taking up arms against the, the Habsburgs, um, including uh, Frederick Niffler and his family who were from Arad. Today, Arad is, is part of Transylvania. Uh, sorry, it is Transylvania and it's part of Romania. But as, as I told before, the Hungarian Jews, the, the, the Jews who lived uh, in the historical Hungary, they identified as Hungarians. They did not identify as Romanians, not even after World War I either, or they didn't identify uh, as any other uh, nationalities. So um, it was very common for Jews to join. It was also the birth of the Reform Judaism in Hungary, which again has a special importance because um, Frederick Niffler's father, Nathan, who was a surgeon, and the captain in the Revolutionary Army, he later moved with his family to Indianapolis, and they were one of the founding fathers of the, of the local Jewish community, which uh, I understand till present day, it is a reformed community. Um, Frederick Niffler was only about 15 or 16 years old when the revolution erupted. There are different um, records about his date of birth. It was not uncommon for young Jews to join. There were Jews who joined for adventure, and there were also Jews who joined for, from passion, fighting for equal rights. And there were also Jews who, who joined because religiously they believed that Jewish uh, traditions, Jewish religion is, is all for equality. August Bondi was um, one of these other Jews. He was from Vienna, and he was a K abolitionist. He was also about 15 years old. Uh, when the um, revolutions of 1848 reached, uh, reached him and he was on the barricades and he later became friends with John Brown and took part in Harper's Ferry and he freed slaves. Um, so there were thousands of young Jews like that. 
These revolutions were crushed everywhere and with Russia's intervention brutally in Hungary. And the Jewish uh, community was going to be severely punished by the Habsburgs. Uh, this included imprisonment, executions, and uh, also they find the Jewish communities indiscriminately. They had to pay huge reparations for assisting the Hungarians. Prominent rabbis were imprisoned for years in terrible conditions. So Jews began to leave um, the Habsburg Empire and also um, the, the German states in organized way. So they created um, uh, immigration, um, yeah, immigration committee um, in Pressburg, which is today uh, Slovakia. And uh, tens of thousands of them are leaving uh, Europe uh, for a better life in the United States in the late for, uh, in, in uh, late 1949 and also in the early 1850s, including the Niflai family who settled down in Indianapolis. So uh, this ideology remained with them. There are um, some uh, conspiracy theories which label these portators like um, communist, socialist, and, and this was absolutely not the case. They simply believed in equal rights and they thought that the time for equality and emancipation had finally arrived. And uh, once they settled down in America, uh, in New York, in Ohio, especially in Cincinnati, uh, they became uh, very active. They, they don't like the institution of the slavery. So already prior to the war, many of these people are taking part in abolitionist activities. Um, therefore, it's no surprise that in 1861, when the civil war erupts, they are going to fight for the union. And let's speak a little bit why their experience is important. Altogether, we are speaking about from 800 to 2000 uh, Jewish uh, soldiers who were 48 years. Uh, and I must mention that this was all the small in number in quantity, uh, in quality, it was exactly the opposite. So these people fought the Russian army there are records of uh, Jewish fortators fighting Russian Cossacks. They fought the Imperial Austrian army who were regular well-trained soldiers. And already uh, many of them, when the revolution was crushed, some of them joined uh, the Italians, uh, the Garibaldi who had um, uh, another independence rebellion um, in the 1850s, which was of course smaller than the Hungarian revolution. So they came over as experienced soldiers uh, who rose to the rank of officers. For example, I would like to mention another person, uh, Adolf Hübsch. Uh, not much is known about him in Europe, but uh, he enlisted as a private. He was a G random Jewish teenager, an 18 years old guy, and he finished the war as a lieutenant in an army that first didn't even give equal rights for the Jews. So becoming a lieutenant in an army that was discriminating you for, at, at the first glance, that's a big achievement. It tells you were a brave soldier, you were a skilled soldier. So he later, Hübsch also comes to the United States and he will uh, be one of the most prominent rabbis of the community, which is known today as the Central Synagogue of Manhattan. Uh, so we have these Jews now in America. They know how to lead armies. They have uh, experience how to fight wars and the union needs them because the majority of the uh, skilled officers are in the service of the Confederates. And um, they were not forced to go into the army. They were still very passionate. They still believed in, in, in what they fought for, in equal rights, and they opposed the slavery very much. And more importantly, they wanted to keep the unity of their country, of their new country. There are, I came across a number of letters that they were speaking about the United States as a new home, a shelter, even I came over an expression which was called the new Israel. And uh, they were certainly thankful and they wanted to fight for their new country. So they, most of them volunteered. Peter, uh, I, have a, I have a quick point that uh, Kevin raised about uh, Confederate Jewish soldiers. One of the things about Confederate Jewish soldiers was that 
the, the Confederates had a draft. So you didn't have a choice if you were going to fight or not. And there were much fewer number. There were around 6,000 compared to 9,000 Union Jewish soldiers. And as Peter's saying, many of the people who joined up with the Union jo volunteered to fight. They were not drafted. They ideologically believed in fighting slavery. So those are some of the real big key differences between Confederate Jewish soldiers and Union Jewish soldiers was there most Jewish soldiers in the Union Army ideologically were against slavery. They were not draftees. Exactly. And, and, and very good that you reminded me there is just so much in my head and I wanted to discuss this in, in, in more details as well. There is a big difference between Jews who were born in America and Jews who came uh, or were influenced by the 1840s revolutions. So while uh, Judah P. Benjamin um, and a number of other Confederate Jews uh, who were born there uh, proudly fought for the Confederacy, the Jews who were 48ers, even if they lived um, in Confederate state, they, they didn't like the, the, um, the slavery and the Confederacy. Perhaps one of the best examples is Leopold Karpelis, who was a previous Texas Ranger, and he became a Medal of Honor recipient um, in the Union Army, and uh, his brother actually served uh, loyally for the Confederates, but he left Texas and he joined uh, a Massachusetts Regiment also, uh, as Mike said, for ideological reasons. Although Carpelis wasn't uh, a 48er, his family raised him in the same manner. He was uh, under the influence of the 48ers. He was too young to, to have fought the, in the revolutions, but ideologically, he was under the influence and he defected and joined a Union regiment. And actually there was also a contemporary poster in which um, European immigrants, uh, mostly from uh, Western Europe are forcefully being drafted into the Confederate army and it was written Southern volunteers. Um, it was just depicting them that yes, these people didn't want to volunteer for the Confederate army, but. But again, to mention the Jews who were born in the Confederacy, they loyally fought for the Confederacy, and their number was probably about 3,000. Again, speaking about the numbers, I identified lots of Jews who were not uh, recognized as Jewish soldiers before by Simon Wolf. Simon Wolf wrote um, a very famous book um, about the American Jewish participation in the Civil War. Because these uh, 48 Jews, identified as Hungarian or as German, or they were just simply German speakers, many times their immigration records did mention nothing about their Jewish connections. And it just became later known to the public or feel when I started to research their faith, their showing, um, digging out their birth certificates, and then, and, and, and then um, comparing the, the records of the same person in the American Civil War, wow, they, these are the same people and, and they were Jewish but not many people know about it in, in America. And this will come, uh, uh, this, this, this topic will raise again when we go into General Frederick Niffler because uh, there were various reports about him being a, a faithful Jew, a convert to Christianity or just a secular. Um, we have fortunately enough time to, to discuss that as well. So when they volunteer and bring their experience, they are given the rank of officers, which is really impressive. So. About Niffler, there was one newspaper which wrongly wrote that he enlisted as a, as a private and made his way to Brevet Brigadier General. In fact, I found two records. One was saying that he was a lieutenant, and another record was saying that he started his career as a captain. I believe that uh, definitely he was given the rank of officer, considering his experience from 1848. Uh, secondary, there was also a Jewish uh, former 48er and veteran of also of the Garibaldi movement, Colonel Utasi, and he was the founder of the 39th uh, New York Infantry Regiment, um, and he was immediately given the rank of colonel. Uh, his fate is, is totally different and very controversial, so I'm not touching that. Uh, but uh, most of the 48ers were at least sergeants or lieutenants from the beginning, and many of them rose to the rank of colonel, or as we can see, brevet brigadier general like Frederick Niffler, or like Charles Manley, or Major General Julius Tejel. Um, going back to Niffler, so he first will um, join the 11th Indiana uh, Infantry 
uh, he wants to fight for his new country and uh, he's going to serve under uh, Lou Wallace. And um, during the records, I was checking also in the American Jewish archives in Cincinnati, also in Hungarian archives, I even found reference that um, Niffler's heroism as a Jewish hero inspired uh, Lou Wallace of the, of the story Ben Hur. It's some may say it's a legend, but certainly what Niffler did in the war um, would support this. So he took part in, uh, in, in most major campaigns and um, he was also at Shiloh and he was also at Chickamauga. I hope I, I pronounced that well. Uh, but he's, uh, he's mostly known for his heroism at the Battle of Missionary Ridge. He was um, given orders to uh, take a, a rifle pit of, of the Confederates, but he conquered the, the whole, whole ridge uh, with uh, much less casualties. And actually, that is, um, I just have a two months old baby and to make Raya we close the door if, if that happens. Um, so when he captured that, uh, that was brought to the attention of uh, even General Grant and he's known for uh, remembering, and I can tell you the exact uh, quotation from, from General Grant. I just uh, will look it up quickly. Here it is. So this is from Indiana's Great Civil War article, um, the Jewish Post, and it is written that later General Ulysses S. Grant then President of the United States told John C. New, prominent Indianian, that he remembered Niffler as the first field officer who reached the top of Missionary Ridge. New said that Grant had told him that Colonel Niffler exceeded his orders and had been told only to take the rifle pits guarding the approach to the ridge. Grant is said to have recalled Colonel Niffler telling him, according to New, that it was safer for my troops to go to the top of the hill than it was to stop at the bottom. And also that it was a funny record that some officer said that he should have been court-martialed because the order was not conquering the whole hill, but by just taking the, the pits. It was a very risky mission. And uh, he, he actually remembered this day. He remembered when uh, he, so as, it, as Grant remembered, he was the first field officer climbing up. Indeed he was. Uh, with uh, another uh, Union officer, and the, they were remembering how the Confederate barrage um, volleys of fire were above their head. And that's when Niffler said that he thinks that in that moment his hair uh, grow to be gray because he was a gray haired man uh, in most of his life. Um, so that is certainly a huge heroism that um, made him also very popular among his troops. First, because he was there when he had to be second, it was also written about him that he was um, sharing exactly the same conditions, sleeping uh, with, um, sleeping in the same tent, uh, with, uh, even with enlisted privates. And he was looking after uh, his soldiers. He was a very humanist officer, which is not a surprise, um, um, as we know his ideology and his background. So from the beginning, he was very talented. So as a captain in 1861, he quickly rose to become a commander, became a com colonel of the, of the 79th Indiana already in uh, 1862 August. Uh, I, I think that tells a lot about his um, expertise. He also took part in uh, Sherman marches um, on the sea and um, there was not a single, um, negative record that I found about his military career. Um, on the opposite, I actually found some controversial information about his Jewishness. So uh, some say, some of the contemporary newspapers wrote that it was not known about him that he was Jewish. But uh, Lou Wallace and uh, Major General uh, Oliver O. Howard contradicted it. So I have another quote uh, from, from um, General Howard about on the Jewish soldiers, including when asked about Niffler. So Major General o. Howard said that 
after speaking of one of his Jewish staff as being the bravest and best and of another killed in Chancellorsville as being a true friend and brave officer said, instinctually there are no more patriotic men to be found in the country than those who claim to be of Hebrew descent and who served with me in parallel command or directly under my instruction. Um, that tells a lot about uh, Niffler. I think he did not advertise him as a Jew, but I also think he did not deny that he was a Jew. Um, the records I found about his post-war um, uh, life that to some extent he was active in the community, but once he, he just uh, stopped paying membership fees, um, then there was a report that he married uh, a Christian woman and that he was a convert to Judaism, a, con a convert to Christianity from Judaism. Um, not much is known about his first marriage. About his second marriage, he, he, he married Beth Rosenblut, who was also a distant relative of mine. And when I was doing the film, I was approached by Frederick Niffler's descendants when we put together the puzzles. So he remained Jewish, but it appears there were periods in his uh, lifetime when uh, Judaism didn't play uh, a key role in him. And also it uh, looks like to me that he, 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 he turned back to Judaism when he was a little bit older in his older ages. I have a funny vignette to share uh, that I read in the newspaper. So apparently he introduced a chaplain to his unit, to his brigade. And uh, during the introduction to this Christian chaplain, he just couldn't stop cussing. So it was like, here's this explicit deleted chaplain. You better watch, mind your explicit uh, deleted manners while you, while you pray. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing that I think perhaps he couldn't have done that if they had known that he was openly Jewish and saying that. And I don't think he probably would I mean, to me, I don't know of any other generals that would have said explicit deleted in that context next to a chaplain who was who was Christian. I, I could be wrong about that. And I think it also talks about just how secular he was. And he, the, a lot of the 48ers were uh, what you would call free thinkers today. Um, back in a time when it wasn't acceptable to be an agnostic or to be atheist. And uh, a lot of the the circle that he kind of ran in Indianapolis were sort of free thinkers. So one could think that perhaps he quietly became an agnostic or an atheist and a secular person, perhaps due to the war. Um, but again, we don't really have anything to support that. But we certainly don't have anything that backs up that he converted to Christianity, baptismal information, or that he joined a church. We just know that he sort of quietly dropped out of Jewish life. Yes, exactly. That, that was uh, very common about the four theaters as well. Uh, I, I, some of them, a tiny, a tiny percentage of them converted to Christianity. But let's mention that these people didn't want Jews to convert to Christianity. Uh, they were proud Jews, they, but they, they wanted equal rights. And um, um, I, I came across uh, a number of different uh, um, figures who who became again Jewish in their later life, but uh, during their youth and, and, and during their 30s, 40s, it was not the most dominant. They never denied it, but they, they didn't advertise it as I'm, I'm a Jewish, I'm a Jewish officer or, or like that. Um, and they were not really asked. The United States was a lot more liberal, um, even though it was different that time than now. It was still a lot more liberal than any European country. So. Um, we, of course, we know about Grant's order when he, he wanted to expel uh, the Jews, and that really backfired, and he had to withdraw the order, and until this day, the United States is not a Christian country, so they probably didn't feel the need to speak about their Jewishness as well. Um, yes, in, in the later life, there, there were controversial information, some information said that he was active to some extent. Uh, his funeral was very simple. He only had a wooden coffin. Uh, he said, I don't believe in wasting on dead bodies. <laughs> he definitely had a sense of humor. Um, and again, about the Christian thing, 
there was just a speculation because of his uh, first marriage, which, which didn't last long. Um, I don't think that he converted to, to Christianity. I think that for a period of time, maybe because of the wartime experience, he probably was a non-believer or an agnostic. And I think there was a question about his first language. So uh, he was fluent both in Hungarian and in German language as well. He served with lots of Germans. He, he remembers them in, in his uh, letters. And, he, and at that time, of course, he, he spoke positively uh, about them, about the Germans in America. Most of them uh, were also, uh, well, not most of them, but a huge part of them were four theaters like Siegel and um, Blanker. And um, and that time, that was a different environment between the Jews and Germany. Although in Europe, it was different. The, the Germans who stayed in Europe, especially in, in Austria-Hungary, they were a lot more anti-Semitic because the, they were fearful of, uh, of the Jewish emancipation, the Jewish artisans, Jewish professionals would rise up, Jewish manufacturing would, would uh, cherish. It was a, a danger for the Germans. Um, but in America, uh, they didn't have problems. For example, Joseph uh, Pulitzer, who was uh, also from Hungary, and he served in the in, in Lincoln Cavalry Regiment. He initially spoke uh, just German language. Uh, he didn't know English when he arrived, and he served with mostly with German volunteers, and he didn't have any any problem with them. Uh, Neffler's family uh, is Jewish till this day. I mean, his descendants. So th I, I think that just confirms everything that maybe for a period of time he was not really into the Jewish community, but for his later life he was, and his uh, descendants remain Jewish. So uh, could you tell us a little bit about his involvement in the Soldiers and Sailors Monument? And, and building it. Yeah, I, I think he, he was uh, one of the regents, I think, of, of, of that. He was one of the key supporters of that. He wanted that he were, all of these soldiers would be remembered, especially that Indiana was very close to him from the beginning, having established Jewish community, even Hebrew school. By the way, he was also a Hebrew speaker and a Hebrew lead, uh, reader. Uh, he was kind of a language uh, genius as well. Um, I did not completely, didn't properly research his uh, um, activity about the monument, but he was a key member, and I also believe that he donated uh, from his own money. And his uh, period with pensions, uh, his work as an advocate for uh, for pensioners after the Civil War, was that a big part of his uh, career after the war? Yes, I would say so probably also kept him out of politics i would say because <laughs> he was fighting the government over over pensions uh for people who really deserved it um what would you say um you know going back to this uh this relationship that he had with uh lou wallace there was a, an event that happened where lou wallace lost his uh, lost his command. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what transpired when Lew Wallace lost his yeah, command? Do you mean when there was a lost command, and I think at the Battle of Shiloh, and which uh, helped uh, Lew Wallace and Grant reconciling? There was a story that uh, in the heave of the battle, um, Frederick Niffler at that time lost uh, a command, which later actually uh, became useful between the two generals reconciling Lou Wallace and Grant, uh, which was unintentional, but in the end it became fruitful. And I saw there was a question, he was from Arad. So uh, Arad is today Romania, it's part of the Transylvanian region. At that time, um, it was, um, that time actually it was not part of Hungary, but they wanted union with Transylvania because for most of the time in history, Transylvania was part of Hungary. So yeah, he was from Arad, um, which had a prominent Jewish community, uh, lots of uh, reformed Jews and all, um, came from, from Arad to the United States at that time. And actually, I also found out that uh, one of my great, great uncles, who was a fourth eighter from Arad, uh, Samuel Rosenblut, who served as a, as a second lieutenant, he was together with uh, uh, Niflar 
during the 1840s revolution. So there was a, a little personal connection and, and this, perhaps this is how he must have met Bertha Rosenblatt probably uh, from, from Arad, who, who he married later as a second wife. So certainly they, uh, they were Jewish and they raised uh, Jewish children as, as we know. Um, yeah, I, I would say that's, that's um, the summary um, I would uh, share about uh, Niffler, his saber and his um, uh, revolver were, were um, portrayed in the late 19th century. I, I don't know if it's still viewable. I will um, I'll, I'll look into that. But his uh, musket was also on display according to the Jewish Post. Interesting. I, I saw that picture as well in the Jewish Post. I think yeah. it was from the 1960s. Um, yeah, hopefully it is, it is, it, it is somewhere uh, uh, there. And uh, yes, so the soldiers and sailor monuments were built while General Niffler was president of the Board of Regents. So uh, that's very important that uh, how he was financing it. Um, there was a lot of speculations about his later life, about his Jewishness, but, but like, like um, I, I checked most of the records and his later lights indicate that he, he returned to, the, to Judaism at, uh, at his older age. So um, I, I say that I, I think that's about Niffler uh, and we have definitely time for uh, questions and answers or for speaking about the motivations and, and about details if um, if you guys have questions or if, if Mike, if you want to explore another topic. Well, you know, I find it interesting because there there's 14 people who found uh, Indianapolis Hebrew congregation and uh, Friedrich Niefler and his father, the physician, are two of them. And but if you look at all of the other people who founded IHC, Indianapolis Hebrew congregation, almost all of them were in the mercantile uh, professions. They were working in clothing. And so uh, Friedrich Niefler as a law, well, he was first a, uh, a carpenter, then a lawyer. Uh, and lawyer. and uh, his father being a physician were kind of the oddballs out of kind of a group that were almost all in the clothing business, so to speak, um, in, uh, in, in tailoring and in uh, clothing. Um, so it's it's fascinating really you know looking at just the unlikeliness of someone moving up the ranks <laughs> out of you know the 14 people who came to Indianapolis and becoming uh you know a logistical genius and 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 you know it's i think in the book that you were referring to earlier uh by wolf he claim, he makes the claim that there were what five hundred Jewish soldiers from Indiana. Is that correct? Is that not correct? Or maybe more? Um, and the Chappelle's rosters tried to has an effort to try to verify who was actually Jewish and who was not from that list. And what I've found, what they have found, is that you can actually go to the Chappelle's roster and look at different Jewish veterans from the Civil War on that list. And they're always looking for new information. So if you're going to the Kelly Cemetery, the Kelly Street Cemetery, um, they could always use assistance. If you can match up a name or help them, they would greatly appreciate it. Yes, um, so a few, few more things to add. Uh, a number of the Jewish four theaters were very talented. Colonel Yutashi spoke 12 languages and Charles Mundy spoke six languages, and many of them had um, multiple professions. They were quickly adapting. It is noted that especially in Ohio, in Cincinnati, that time that had, was a, a very prominent Jewish community um, where the Hebrew Union College was founded. Uh, Colonel Utashi settled down there as well. Um, Yes, uh, the other thing about the, the data, I, I think there were minimum 500 uh, Jewish soldiers from Indiana. And uh, exactly for the reasons that there were so many newcomers in the, in the United States. So most of the Jews uh, began in, in, in huge waves. They are immigrating after the revolutions of 1848. And, uh, and, and so many of them uh, didn't tell that they were Jewish. And that's where the Chappelle roster does not have information. I identified a few of them for them. 
but uh, of course we can't identify every single soldier. But what I was doing, and what I'm doing also on a, on, in a different project, um, I am um, I'm, I'm identifying, for example, uh, one regiment or a few regiments, and uh, and 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 their locations, and based on that, I pro rata compare it proportionately to other regiments where we have significant number of Jewish names or, or, or towns with major Jewish populations. So I, I would say that in reality, not uh, seven or 8,000 uh, Unionist Jewish soldiers served, but I would say this number could be easily 14, 15,000. For example, General Julius Steinhel was not mentioned as Jewish. He was written as Austrian. Colonel Yutashi was written as German, and later uh, he was mentioned as Jewish. Uh, same about Hitler. Many people didn't know that he was Jewish. Same about General Charles Mundy, who, who was also not on the Schaffer's Rustal. Um, uh, he, he was uh, uh, Jewish as well. And he was identified as, as a German as well. And then there were those who were identified um, as, as Hungarian, like uh, Emmanuel Lederer, um, lieutenant from the 39th Infantry. So I just mentioned five names of of skilled veterans and high-ranking officers who were not mentioned, uh, who were not mentioned uh, that they were Jewish. So, if we look at this trend, we can only participate. We can only assume there were a lot more, because um, um, they brought that, that. That was the generation of of like August Bonde, Leopold Karpolis, who who were much younger, and there were Jews who were children during the 1848 revolutions. They arrived in America as Germans or Hungarians, and later they fought in the Union Army. And again, at that time, they were considered Germans or just ordinary Americans. So all the records that were available to me and, uh, and oral testimonies, that isn't that strange that uh, Major General Oliver O. Howard can speak about a uh, mass number of Jewish soldiers. He personally remembers Jewish soldiers being heroes or how Grant remembered uh, Frederick Niffler long before he was a general. So, it so can, makes, it oh, makes me think that there had to be a bigger number of Jewish soldiers than are currently documented. So thank you for that. Uh, Kevin Korn had an interesting point, and he's asking about, uh, yes, there were Jews in that regiment of Germans, but Friedrich Niffler was not in that unit. In fact, the unit he was in from what I understand, didn't have very many immigrants in it at all uh, that he was commanding. Uh, but there are there are there were units in Chicago and New York that were predominantly Jewish immigrants. And we know that German unit that you're saying, I can't remember the name of that unit. Uh, Blanca's rifle, probably. Uh, that was in Indiana, had many Jews. And in. in fact, one of their first casualties was Jewish in Kentucky. I'll try to find that name for you. Uh, I have to, I have to dig up that name. Uh, but no, Niefler was not in that unit. He was actually in a unit of, uh, of, uh, American born, uh, of a uh, American born Anglos mostly. Correct, Peter? Yeah. But, uh, it would be also good to know that the, the Jews who immigrated and, and, and their children came with them, how they were, because they probably were already Americanized. For example, um, uh, I believe Leopold Karpelis was already Americanized. Uh, I, I, I definitely saw a passport application from him. And uh, I, I think so, because before the Civil War, he was um, in, uh, he was a Texas Ranger and he fought the, the Native Americans. So I assume he had to be uh, a citizen already before the uh, Civil War, although the place of birth was uh, written uh, Hungary wrongly because he was from Prague, but it was still part of the Austrian Empire. So it's uh, it, it's it's very hard to say, but that's where uh, my research comes in to help that I have access to the birth certificates and to um, in, in Europe. And uh, this is how with a tremendous work, but we can if, dig into to civil war soldiers. So if you see, let's say an example of how we did with the Chappelle, we suspect um, someone that he is Jewish. He has a Jewish name, and the location around him has Jews. Then, then, and and if the person was not born in America, then I did look up him 
in the Hungarian or European records, or I looked up his parents' records, because certainly there were also some number of uh, Jews who were baptized at birth, but both of their parents were Jewish. That, uh, that was also common uh, to some extent. So we have some more questions here. Uh, Trent was talking about uh, who, uh, I, 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 well, one person who writes uh, about questioning his Jewishness is uh, Judith Endelman uh, in her book on the Jewish community of Indianapolis. And I think it's based on a number of articles that question his Jewishness. But I think you have to look at the time period because there was a huge hoopla over um uh general maurice rose who died in world war ii was the highest ranking uh, uh officer to die in world war ii and he converted to christianity uh however <laughs> a lot of people identified him as being jewish in fact they had a star of david out first and then was replaced by a cross who his wife who was not jewish insisted that he was not jewish um so and there were even, you know, uh, Jewish war veteran units named, you know, Maurice Rose unit and the local uh, Indianapolis chapter of the uh, Jewish war vets was called the Friedrich Niefler chapter. So I think that's part of it was just sort of the timing of that and questioning, you know, uh, questioning, questioning his background. Um and just the the stereotypical idea of the Jewish warrior in the diaspora is not a stereotype that a lot of people place with Jews. So people question this, um, but it's true that there were there were diasporic Jewish warriors. There's a diasporic Jewish warrior tradition of people who fought in different armies. And um, this is an area that's not really studied very well and it's not very well understood. Um, and I think I re we really have to thank people like Peter for bringing this to people's attention and understanding this diasporic uh, uh, Jewish warrior tradition that existed for thousands of years. Uh, that a lot of people don't understand, even academics and scholars, you know, try to question it because it just seems to them outside of the norm. But in reality, it's something that existed and is worthy of being studied and understood. Um, and Friedrich Niefler kind of is, is part of that. He's a Jewish warrior. He's part of that tradition. Um, going back you know, people, you, you're, you're talking about, you know, him and his family fighting Cossacks. This, is, this was not uh, something totally unknown to Jews uh, exactly. in Europe. Also, it is worth to mention that they were often referring themselves as uh, the descendants of the Maccabeans. So again, it's something that maybe they were not that religious as there was a general enlightenment in the 19th century, but certainly they were proud Jews. I, I wouldn't say they were early Zionists, but, but they were certainly proud of being Jewish and as a nation. Um, on multiple um, occasions, I found this, that we are the descendants of the great Maccabeans, and now it is our time to show what we can do. Um, and also the Jewish Four Theaters, uh, my first movie about this topic, I, I made that for education a purpose. It's free. It can be found on YouTube, and there is a lot more uh, information available. Uh, not just about Niefler, but uh, but also about other Jewish officers, generals, and about Jews in general um, who came after the revolution of 48 to, to fight in the Union Army when it was necessary. So do we have some more questions here? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> um... Was there anything that really surprised you when you started to research? I got another question from Trent. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I would. OK, it's more of a comment. Veterans get memorials in their graves, but never spoke about their experiences, probably to forget. Hence, they would identify as warriors. Uh, Trent, could you I, I'm, I'm kind of missing the could you kind of uh, illustrate what you're saying here? Uh, if you can turn yourself off mute. You're on mute. Trent. <laughs> Thanks. I just, I just think, you know, that most soldiers um, that we memorialize them as veterans and put markers on their graves, but they never speak of that experience. And, and, and unless they call themselves the Jewish warrior, I don't know if I would 
would label them as that. It looks like to me that they labeled themselves as Jewish warriors before the war and during the war. And of course, after the trauma and all the atrocities of the war, this could have really changed them. And they took a low profile, speaking less about their experience. But, but they called themselves warriors um, uh, in, eight, in 1848. I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, about uh, other wars, but in 1848, on a number of occasions, I, I, I saw this expression. But you know, it is all. It is always how revolutions and war starts. Everybody is excited in the beginning. Um, they want to show uh, their loyalty, and when the reality of the war reaches them, that's leaving them post-trauma test syndrome. So um, yeah. Thank you. And uh, Mike, I think there was a question. What surprised me during the research? Is that right? Yeah. What were some things that you didn't think that you would encounter that you found? Well, I, I didn't know there were so many jobs. I had a feeling that uh, there were more than, than presented. And, and one of the reasons I started is because I knew about jobs who did great things. And it disturbed me that they are not remembered as jobs. And I wanted to uh, combat anti-Semitic lies that, you know, the jobs would be loyal, un, not loyal, cover to fight for their countries. At, when I digged into the research, um, I, I, I was just surprised that there were people, I, even I didn't expect that they were Jews, they were actually Jews. So for example, I tell another example, uh, Hungarian records indicated that 20,000 Jews fought uh, for the Hungarian revolution. And an American record from the American Jewish uh, archives indicated 35,000. And that was told by um, Lajos Kossuth, who was uh, the revolutionary governor of, of Hungary um, at that time. And I certainly believe if you see the immigration uh, records, um, we can um, estimate the, on the percentage and proportion wise of the immigrants leaving the community that, yeah, it's likely that uh, a much higher number of Jews served, not, not just in the civil war, but also in the 1840 revolutions. Um, also by Joseph Pulitzer, I, I don't think he was mentioned on Simon Wolf's list, but uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure about that. But he was a civil war soldier. And by the way, he didn't like his service, as he remembered later. So he was probably one of those veterans who stopped speaking about their, their experience. But he was a very, um, uh, ex um, he was very devoted. He wanted to join the, the army uh, initially uh, in Europe. And the Prussian army, he also tried the Prussian army with no luck, the French foreign legion with no luck. And then when the civil war broke out, um, he was recruited uh, by the Germans and, and arrived to America. Okay, do we have uh, any other questions here? Well, um, if we don't have any other questions. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Peter for coming here today. Um, this will be recorded. If you want a uh, recording of this, uh, let me know. Uh, we're also going to put it on our website. And uh, hope the little baby isn't key to keep you up all night. I know how that is. So <laughs> no, she, she, she does at the moment, but in, in, in four weeks, um, I believe it will be better when she will be three months old. Oh, all right. That's that's uh, those are those are precious memories. Remember them forever. <laughs> so, thank you so much, and uh, and have a have a great evening there in, in the UK. You're very welcome, and and like I said, feel free to look up the Jewish Four Theaters. It's free on YouTube, and uh, if if you like it, if you if you want to learn more about the World War One side of the things, then then check the Miami Jewish Film Festivals page. Stabbed in the back. And then uh, you can still watch it, I think, up, uh, up to, to tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.